Hi folks, welcome to FIRE 605, Pensions and Benefits Administration. My name is Dr. Miller and we'll be looking at Chapter 1 this week in on Module 1. And looking at uh, Module 1, Chapter 1, let me pre uh, present you with the outline that we'll be covering. We'll be looking at learning objectives, then going through some defining and exploring employee benefits. The third, our third part today will be looking at the field of employee benefits practice. At four, we'll be touching on the origins of employee benefits. Five, the legal and regulatory influences on discretionary benefits practices. Six, we'll be touching on strategic benefits, strategic planning for benefits programs. And finally, we'll be looking at the information used in strategic benefits planning. We'll go deeper into some of these aspects and less so in others. Beginning with our learning objectives, the origins, we'll explore the origins of employee benefits practice, discuss various legally required and discretionary benefits, touch on the legal and regulatory influences on employee benefits practices, discuss the various types of information used to develop strategic benefit plans. Part two, in terms of defining and exploring employee benefits, we have, uh, we have to first begin by defining employee benefits. And boy, employee benefits are a complex part of the compensation system, generally not well understood. Compensation other than hourly wages or salary includes protection programs, pay time off, and accommodation and enhancement programs such as tuition reimbursement, for example. The three fundamental rules of employee benefits are protection programs to help guard against loss, such, such as things like unemployment, disability, serious illness. Another fundamental role of employee benefits is paid time off policies that compensate employees when they're not performing their primary work duties. Two broad sources of benefits include the legally required benefits, such as those mandated by the federal government, like Social Security, and additional benefits not mandated by the federal government, such as paid time off. When we talk about employee benefits in a total compensation scheme, we like to think about total compensation including monetary plus non-monetary awards, non-monetary compensation includes things like uh, core compensation, adjustments to core compensation, legally required benefits, discretionary benefits. These are total compensation that includes non-monetary rewards. The field of employee benefits practice, you may ask, well, why is this important? What type of professional development is offered for managers? What are some of the legally required benefits? What are some of the discretionary benefits? We also touch on the basic designs of discretionary benefit plans. The most common benefits, why they're important, employee benefit managers and specialists ensure that programs achieve legal compliance, such as they do with St. Joseph's, that the company has a competitive advantage, that benefits design and administration are most cost effective. Note that the complexity of the benefits packages offered is increasing. The field of employee benefits practice also includes professional development for managers to help keep managers abreast of legal changes. Professional development also includes offering new ideas for innovative practices. 
The legally required benefits are mandated by federal laws such as Social Security, State Workers' Compensation, and the Federal Family and Medical Leave Act of 1993. Discretionary benefits are those the company can choose to offer a wide variety of discretionary benefits. These benefits fulfill, fulfill three main roles. Discretionary benefits give employees income and health protections, allow employees paid time off, offer employees benefits designed to improve their quality of life. Income protection programs use disability insurance for non-related work, non-work-related illnesses. Life insurance provides a deceased employee's family member's financial protection. And retirement plans provide employees a retirement income. The basic designs of employee benefits, two main considerations. One, are they cost-effective? Two, will they promote recruitment and retention of highly qualified workers that St. Joseph's University might need? Some of the common features of benefit plans include eligibility provisions, the kinds of plans, the level of benefits offered, waiting period provisions, financing options, employee choice, and communication. The fourth part of Chapter 1 looks at the origins of employee benefits. We explore that there are different forces that led to the rise of legally required and discretionary benefits in the U.S. The government established programs to protect individuals with disability and unemployment back in the 1930s. Historically, employee benefits were a legally required form of social insurance. In terms of the history of, of the origin of employee benefits, employer sponsorship of medical insurance has become common. Employees typically view benefits as an entitlement, but more employers today are helping employees realize the true cost of these employee benefits. Item 5 talks about the legal and regulatory influences on discretionary benefits practices. One, they're necessary to distinguish between private sector empo employers and government employers. In 2011, private sector companies employed 109 million U.S. civilian employees, mostly for profit. Conflicting goals between employers and employees necessitate laws and regulations to protect employees. Prior to 1930, employees had no rights. Before 1974, the ERISA Act, employees could lose employee retirement benefits. Public sector employees usually include US, US federal, state, and local entities. ERISA, no, please note, does not apply to public sector retirement plans. Part 6 of Chapter 1 touches on the strategic planning for benefits programs. We touch on basic strategic planning concepts, approaches to, and approaches to strategic benefits planning. In terms of basic strategic planning concepts, Strategic planning involves making judgments that companies direct towards making strategic decisions. Two kinds of decisions. They're either strategic or they're tactical. Tactical decisions are implemented to carry out strategic decisions. Strategic planning should support overall business objectives. Business objectives are part of the company's competitive strategy on how to best use company's resources to sustain competitive advantage. The competitive strategy as part of the strategic planning for employee benefits 
It's a planned use of company resources, the company's technology, human resources, and capital resources to create and, and sustain competitive advantage. Strategies include human resource strategies, total compensation strategies, and benefit strategies. Benefits tactics answer two questions. Does offering particular benefits support the company's benefit strategy? What is the optimal design of these benefits? Part B of strategic planning for benefits programs touches on approaches to strategic benefits planning. Top-down approach involves a proactive process where company benefits are periodically reviewed and changed when necessary. A backing-in approach, which is a reactive approach, whereas where, whereby a company's benefit programs are reviewed only when problems arise. Our final section today looks, section seven of chapter one, looks at information used in strategic benefits planning. We look at two main categories, the external environment and the internal environment. In terms of the two main categories of information used in strategic benefits planning, there's the external environment and the internal environment. The external environment are factors outside the direct control of a company. Some of these factors might include industry prospects, economic conditions, forecasts, employer costs for compensation and benefits, uh, the government regulation of employee benefits, and finally, another external factor is the changing demographics of the workforce. Other factors in the external environment continuing on are the employer costs for the compensation of benefits, the government programs of employee benefits, which includes the adequacy of legally required benefits, employee expectations, and the cost of legally required benefits. Another external item in the environment is the changing demographics of the workforce. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the labor force diversity will continue to increase based upon gender, age, race, and ethnicity. The internal environment includes major factors such as workforce demographics, collective bargaining agreements, workforce demographics, whereby diversity is expected to increase. The internal environment also includes collective bargaining agreements, which touches on the specific terms of employment for workers like union workers. Collective bargaining also touches on pay, benefits, and working conditions. As a summary then, uh, chapter one discusses the origins of employee benefits, various legally required benefits such as the Social Security Act of 1935, state compulsory disability laws, the Family Medical Leave Act, and discretionary benefits such as income protection programs, health protection programs, and paid time off. Also, the strategic importance of employee benefits as well as various types of information used in strategic benefit planning, such as external market and internal company environment, are discussed. Thank you.